For us to have a home with God, we need a land completely devoted to Him. We need a place that has not been completely devoted to destruction. That is the mission God's people are on in the book of Joshua, a mission to reclaim a space to live with God, a mission to recapture the place God chose as his region. But to understand what's happening in Joshua, we have to go back to the Garden of Eden. For there, in the beginning, we see that it was always God's plan to have a place to live with his creation. The garden was to be the home for us and God. This was supposed to be our perfect habitation. It was to be a place devoted to God and a place where God was devoted to us, a place where he would be with us, where we both would be planted, a garden we would tend, grow, and manage, a land where heaven and earth came together that would expand to fill the planet. But instead of devoting themselves and the land to God, Adam and Eve devoted it to damage. They took what was dedicated to God to be used for their own advantage. They rejected God's devotion, committing their home to death and destruction. So from their shared land, they would be driven out. Humanity itself would be devoted to corruption. But in the garden, God was still devoted to his people. He would bring them back home, even though it would mean destruction. God had plans to inhabit another land with his creation a chosen land where he and his chosen people could once again dwell in perfect habitation. And the name of this land was Canaan. But instead of devoting themselves and the land to God, the inhabitants devoted it to damage. They took what was dedicated to God to be used for their own advantage. They destroyed God's home, replacing devotion with desolation. They ravaged God's land and sought to unmake his creation. So God raised up Israel and brought them to Canaan so they could enter the land and reclaim it. Joshua would lead this reconstruction, but only under the command of God's instructions. They were to drive out the inhabitants, put an end to their corruption, and create a land devoted to God by devoting the Canaanites to destruction. Yet, not everyone in Canaan was an obstruction. Some, like Rahab, heard about Israel's God and wanted to devote themselves to this land's new construction. Which is why, in the first story of Israel's entrance into the land, it's not God's destruction we see, but God's devotion to save even Canaanites from destruction's hand. Nevertheless, it was to destruction most of Canaan was devoted. So God sent Joshua and his army to pluck up and to plow. From the land, God would drive them out. For Israel to have a home with God, they needed a land completely devoted to him. And that place would be Canaan after it was completely devoted to destruction. And so, as Adam and Eve were meant to spread the Garden of Eden, the people of Israel were meant to spread throughout the nation. And yet, after many generations, the work was never finished. In fact, Israel only added to the land's decimation. 
In fact, the whole world has been ravaged, unmade, and desolated by us who were supposed to join God in creation. But God was still devoted to his people, like he was at the Garden of Eden. So God sent a new leader like Joshua to finish the work of the world's reclamation. And that new leader is Jesus, who, like Joshua, entered a broken and evil land. And like Israel's army, he came to drive out our pollution by God's mighty hand. But in another garden, Jesus would prove his devotion, as he knew it would come to pass all the way back in the Garden of Eden, he knew who had to be destroyed for God's home to cover the planet. Jesus devoted himself to God, willingly devoting himself to damage. He dedicated himself to God for our advantage. For unlike Joshua, he would not rebuild this world by destroying those who brought the corruption. Instead, on the cross, Jesus himself would be devoted to our destruction. For us to have a home with God, we need a land completely devoted to him. And Jesus creates that place by completely devoting himself to destruction. But now we can pick up where they left off. We can join God in the garden again. For when we devote ourselves to Jesus, we join him by tending and growing our home in the places around us that still face corruption. So we go like Joshua, but we go with Jesus, not as those who were driven out or those who brought destruction to the land of Canaan, but we go as those finally united with God. We go as gardeners of the new creation. Our Bible reading today is um, Joshua chapter 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. But to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you after he said, the Lord your God will give you rest by giving you this land. Your wives, your children, and your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan. But all your fighting men, ready for battle, must cross over ahead of your fellow Israelites. You are to help them until the Lord gives them rest, as he has done for you. 
and, and until they too have taken possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. After that, you may go back and occupy your own land, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you east of the Jordan towards the sunrise. Then they answered Joshua, Whatever you have commanded us, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with us. Sorry. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, whatever you may command them, will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Let me pray and then uh, we'll make a start on that together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have this morning to be together. We thank you for the reminder of your plan for all of creation. And we thank you this morning for um, the story of Joshua. And Father, we pray that you would help us through the power of your spirit reflect on what it means, the side of the cross, to be strong and courageous and to trust you in all things. We pray this um, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and ultimately for your glory. Amen. Be strong and courageous. The Lord of the ages is with you. Uh, it's a great song by Colin. Of course, it's a kid's song but it's taken from this book in Joshua. Um, I wanted to show you that video clip firstly just to help folks, if you haven't worked it out yet, or if you're new to the whole story of Jesus and the Bible and to God, to see that God has a purpose and a plan. And he's had a purpose and a plan from the very beginning, from the very time of the Garden of Eden. It's not as if God continues to scratch his head and try to work out uh, uh, for us uh, a, a new plan every time we change directions or every time we face a fork in the road then God has to change his plans I, I want you to have this assurance and confidence in the Bible and in the story of God that it is one complete story that fits together and I know what you're thinking you're thinking yes God's got a story but really I'm interested in my story and often that's how we come to the scriptures. We come to the scriptures seeking our story. And the truth of the matter is, God's story is about you. It's about me. God's story is about restoration. As the video showed, and as you begin in the book of Genesis, you discover that God creates. With a word, he creates all things. And as he creates, he creates things that are good. Everything that God creates is good. It says something, shouts out about his nature and his character, that God is good. And when life is hard, when there's a fork in the road for you and for me, when we are troubled, when there is stress, when uh, there is pain and suffering, that's the question that comes to mind, isn't it? I was having this conversation just with my youngest daughter this week about her partner um, and growing up in a church, uh, growing up in a Baptist church and now doesn't go to church. And I imagine when you hear his life story, it is a very tragic, difficult story. And the question that always comes to mind with all of that always, is God good? Does God care? If these things happen to me, does God allow them to happen to me? And how can a good and loving God allow me to suffer, to face difficulty and pain? And that's at the essence of it, isn't it? Is God good? Can we trust him? And so, of course, when you read uh, the Old Testament and you hear the stories about someone like Moses who is the great saviour of the people of Israel, Israel are crying out to God for rescue. They are slaves in Egypt under oppression. 
and God raises up Moses to lead them out of Egypt, out of slavery, and take them to the promised land, you hear the story about how God is good and loving and kind and provides for his people. But as you read the story, you discover that Moses takes the people of Israel to the foot of the promised land, to Canaan, and they send spies into the land. Now, this is not Joshua. This is before Joshua. They send spies into the land, and the spies come back, and the spies say, this is not an empty land. This is an occupied land. There are giants living in this land. And these giants are bigger than us, stronger than us, and they're more numerous than us. And they cry out to God through Moses and say, what has God done to us? They actually literally say, God hates us. And as a result of that, God says to them, because of your faithlessness, because of your fear, you will spend the next 40 years in the wilderness marching around in battle formation until this rebellious, sinful, faithless generation dies. And I raise up a new people and this new people I will take into the promised land. The land I promised your forefathers. And so the descendants of Israel have died off and Moses has died. For Moses, like his people, will not enter into the promised land because of their fear and faithlessness. And here we are now in Joshua in chapter 1 where we are told after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord said to Joshua, son of Moses, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River in the land I'm about to give you, the land I'm about to give the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your feet, as I promised Moses. And then he extends the territories. He explains geographically what this area will look like. And so here's where we capture the story, God's big story about restoring the Garden of Eden is right now here about to progress into the land of Canaan, God's people living in God's place under God's rule. Just think about that for a moment, God's people living in God's place under God's rule. Is that not a picture of the Garden of Eden? God who spoke a word and formed creation. God who made male and female in his own image, placing them in a garden. And God who comes in their presence in the Garden of Eden and gives them one command, one rule. You can eat from every other tree in the garden, but do not eat from this one tree. See it? God's people in God's place, under God's rule. And as Joshua is the new leader that takes the place of Moses, he's instructed by God to see and recognize who they are. They are the people of God. They are about to enter into the promised land Yes, don't worry that the promised land is occupied. I've got this, God says. I've got this. Trust me. And you will notice that in this first chapter of Joshua, you will see three times that God says to Joshua, I am with you. I got this, Joshua. I am with you. And four times he says to Joshua, Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous, for I am with you. See verse 5? No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. 
As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land. I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. What is God saying? God is saying to the people of Israel, his people that he had created, that he had made, I've got this, I've got you, I am with you. Be strong and courageous. Enter into the land. And as you enter into the land, your strength and courage is in me, for I am with you. It's a great story, isn't it? There's a second part to God's instruction to the people of Israel. Do you see it? Verse um, 7. Be careful to obey all the, my law my servant Moses has given you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll prosper and be successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. It's great words, aren't they? Great words. God says, I've got this. Trust me. I will be with you. I've got this. Trust me. I've given you a way to live where you will prosper. Just think about the picture. Israelites about to go into the land of Canaan. Mighty nations. Tall people. Outnumbering them. But what you will discover as we work through Joshua is not, it, it, not all is as it seems. That the people of Canaan are corrupt people. That the people of Canaan uh, have little to no moral code. That the people of Canaan are into child sacrifices. That the people of Canaan are into the worship of all forms and many different gods. Sound familiar? Maybe not the... No, I'll just... Sound familiar? Do you know a world like that? And God says to Joshua, to his chosen people, be strong and courageous. I am with you. And obey everything I have commanded you that is found in the law of Moses. God speaks words and he sets a foundation and he makes a rule and he says to his people, live this way. And if you live this way, no matter what's going on in the world around you, I will bless you. I will make you prosper. I will look after you. Do you believe that? Do you believe there's a God who has a way for you to live? Do you believe that there's a God that will journey on the life you are, you, the, the life course you're journeying, that he will journey with you? That he will be with you? That's the promise to Joshua and to the people of Israel. You are my people, you enter into my land, and you live by my rules. There's a thing buzzing. Do, 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 do. Tim, do you want to cancel that thing or whatever? It's, I think it's a band thing. Um, yeah, <laughs> it was just something that's been left on annoying me. Um, <laughs> um, uh, anyway, uh, so that's the picture. 
And then when Jesus comes, all bets are off and everything changes, right? Wrong. I want you to see God's plan. Nothing changes. So when Jesus enters the scene over 800 years later, all the gospels are proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of God is near. That's the message of the gospel. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. God is ushering in his kingdom and he ushers in his kingdom in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see that in the way Jesus lives. You see that in the way Jesus treats humanity. You see that in the way Jesus has victory and control over all things, sickness, death, disease. You see it in his, what comes out of his mouth and the way he speaks and the way he puts the Pharisees and the Sadducees in their place. You see it in his compassion and his kindness. You see it in the way he draws people to himself. Come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You see it as he's drawing this new community to himself and he's saying to them, you are the people of God. I am ushering in the kingdom of God. Come follow me, Jesus says. Do you see the instruction that Jesus gives to his disciples after he has conquered death and before his ascension? Go and look at it in Matthew chapter 28. And what you discover in Matthew chapter 28 is that Jesus says to his disciples, let me read it to you. Here's what he says. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, people often forget this part, oh, let's go make disciples. There's a second part to it, which is also the second part of the Joshua story, isn't it? You are my people. I will be with you. Trust me in this. Now go into the land and obey everything I have commanded you. And here's what Jesus says. Go and make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the ends of the age. You see that? Nothing's changed. God's promise made to Joshua is the same promise God makes to you and me In Christ Jesus. And God says to you and me through the Lord Jesus Christ, go and make disciples and obey all that I have commanded and I will be with you. Be strong and courageous for I am with you. Now often when people think about the notion of strongness and courage, We think of military strength, don't we? I mean, even in the video, you saw the sword. Um, That's pretty telling, isn't it? But what you will discover in the book of Joshua and what you will discover in Jesus is that Joshua very seldom has to raise his sword. Why? Because it's God who goes into battle. It is God who brings about the victory. Why? Because this is God's world. It is his world. He made it. It belongs to him. And you and I belong to him. He rules. He is the one and only true God. There's another song by Colin. And that's what Jesus is saying. You see how Jesus gets the victory? It's not that Jesus lifts a sword in his hands. It's that Jesus goes to the cross. Jesus gives his life in obedience to his father and humbly goes to the cross. What does it mean to be God's people living in God's world? Here's what God says to you through the words of Joshua and perhaps more, even more importantly through the words of Jesus who is Emmanuel which means God with us. That God himself should come to earth and live among us. 
and the power of the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is a gift from God to you and me to live in us. Is God with you or is he not with you? The Spirit of God that lives in you, God is with you. And God says to you and to me, be strong and courageous in this world that we live in. Be obedient to the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ. What did Jesus say? Go and make disciples. What did Jesus say through the New Testament? Don't give in to the flesh. We, we just finished that last week when we looked at Galatians. But live in the Spirit and bear the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's what it means for you and me to be strong and courageous. It's not for you and me to make a political stand. It's not for you and me to put on a battle armor and go to war against the enemies of God in this world. No, no, the way it works is through the power of the cross, through humility, through gentleness, through taking your fears to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I am not strong enough to do this. I'm not strong enough to live in this world that I do in the 21st century where people are hostile towards Christianity. Have you worked that out yet? That the time has changed? 30 years ago, Christianity was kind of accepted, kind of part of culture. Actually, people believed that Christianity was good for culture. We sent all our kids to Sunday school, even if we didn't go ourselves. We sent them to the scripture classes because we believed that there was a foundational principle that Christianity promoted good moral society, right? Right? But I wonder if you've noticed that we now live in a deeply secular society where everything is acceptable other than Christianity. That Christianity today is actually dangerous. We must do everything in our power to rid our secular society here in Australia of anything that smacks of Christianity. Am I overstating things? Or do you feel that? Do you feel that? Now what do you want to do? You want to take up the sword, right? You want to be strong and courageous. Let's go to battle for Jesus, yeah? No. Take up your cross. Take up your cross. With all your anxiety and your fear and your worry, Turn to the God who says, I am with you. I am with you. I have given you my word. I have said to you, you are my people. I've shown that by sending my son to die for you. You are my people. The kingdom of God is near. You take up the cross and now be part of the restoration process. I guarantee you, I guarantee you this, that if you and I as Christians continue to live, that, that what flows out of us is not hatred and enmity and anger and making for war, but if what flows out of us is the fruit of the Spirit, I guarantee you, Secondly, Australia will not survive. And people will come back in their wards to the Lord Jesus Christ and to gospel living because it works. It works. So let me encourage you as you face your everyday situation, whether it be in the workplace, whether it be in the home, whether it be in the social networks, as you continue to face the battle and the hostility and the world that you live in, know this. God says, I am with you. Be strong and courageous. 
Make disciples. Obey all that I have commanded you. Let the fruit of the Spirit flow through you. Be people filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Doesn't that just lift you? <laughs> Imagine if every one of us was filled that way. That would be an awesome place to be, right? That would be an awesome space to live. And you have it. And you are it. So be it. Be God's people, living in God's place, under God's rule. And he will be with you to the end of the age. Be strong and courageous in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many examples you give us in the scriptures of your amazing work to reform, to transform, to renew your creation. Thank you so much for the story of Joshua. Thank you so much for the story of Jesus. Thank you that these stories which are true, inspire us to live as your people in your place, under your rule, and to know that you are redeeming it as you are redeeming us more and more into the likeness of Jesus every day. Please help us to know that you are with us. Please help us to be strong and courageous. Amen.